Okay, there is information in the back of the room to donate blood. If you can't donate blood, there's information in the back of the room to donate money, because every drop counts, but so does every cent. Anything you can give people to save Now for this afternoon speaker. It's a pleasure to welcome award-winning educator, essayist, novelist, and New York Humanities public scholar, Giacomo Calabria, to the stage. Under the pen name Giacomo de la Persia, Giacomo's work has been featured on BBC America, Business Insider, CNN Money, Folger Magazine, The Huffington Post, Political Magazine, Politico Magazine, sorry, Reader's Digest, Ripley's Believe It or Not, Slate, and Princeton University's Electronic Bulletin of the Dante Society of America, among others. He has published three novels, The Great Abraham Lincoln Pocket Watch Conspiracy, License to Quill, and Megatron. Giacomo, welcome. Experiencing in this film 
an incredible rarity. So many of the films we have to do someone now that apply and share it. I've seen as high as 99%, I've seen as low as 91%, but all silent films are gone. This is a very rare example of not only a silent film that literally survived from a single printing that was in France at the time. But this might be the first film in history that survived a deliberate attempt to destroy a copy. I want to make it clear, many films from the silent era are completely gone without efforts to hunt down and destroy every one of these. And it's actually part of a fascinating real-life vampire that surrounds the film that we see. Nosferatu, directed by um, uh, Friedrich Murnau, 1922. So going into this, and sorry for a little jumble because the text didn't translate over pretty well. Uh, so Nosferatu at heart is an unofficial adaptation of Bram Stoker's Dracula. The unofficial aspect of it is something very interesting. It's going to be essential to its legacy. When it comes to its predecessors, we know that it is not the first adaptation of Dracula. We know that there was at least one adaptation beforehand that is likely lost in history. There were probably more than one. And to put it in perspective, when it comes to the predecessors, like, we don't know how many films there actually were when it came to involving Dragon. Like, the first thing we can say about Nosferatu is it's the earliest one we have to survive. When it comes to one of the speculated predecessors, which I believe is a Russian version of Dracula, we actually don't have a lot of information that that existed. We didn't have photos of it or anything like that. So, when we're even though it's only a hundred years ago, so much of this time period is not only lost, but it's not really being rewritten due to new discoveries, some of them as recent as within the past 20 years when it comes to a lot of film. And when it comes to silent film in general, I do want to say that um, going to see a silent film was not a completely silent experience, especially when you have a film such as Nosferatu that could rightfully be considered hard to work real. People would be screaming when they were seeing some of these figures, even when it came to non thrilling films. That uh, there was one famous film from the late 19th century called Arrival of the Train at the Station. Just people seeing a train chugging towards them through the screen caused people to scream and they, they got away. So, what I'm saying is, you don't need to be completely quiet for this film. People would have been speaking the line that they were seeing. There would have been a live orchestra performing. One of the first ever three selected scores for a movie. They didn't have an improvisation score. This was one of the first examples of a score that unfortunately we don't entirely have. And on top of that, there would be children acting up, there would be babies crying, there would be people arguing with each other. So I, I want to say that you do not need to be completely quiet if you want to have a sound of the experience. In fact, if you make a little bit of noise, it will be making it more of and when it comes to what Nosferatu is, it's considered one of the peak examples of German expressionism. And actually, right before I came here, I was on the phone with a friend of mine who's an Academy Award nominated filmmaker. His name is Ray Arrow Fox. He's a documentarian. And I was saying, I'm about to speak to you all, but is there anything that you would like me to mention about Nosferatu? And he said that he hadn't even seen that film since he was a film student, I imagine, back in the 1960s or 1950s. It's a while ago. So the reason why I mention this is because Nosferatu really has been reclaiming popularity in ways, and part of the reason is one because of its role within German Expressionism, but also because of the attempt to erase the film from history. Specifically, when it comes to German Expressionism, it began during World War I and continued for about the next decade afterwards. And it was, I would probably consider it the first great art movement to come from cinema after the individual revolutions in cinema, such as Charlie Chaplin or um, George Meunier's over in France. And I should mention that George Meunier is actually credited with possibly making the first horror film in history. Specifically, he did these incredible sound of films. You've seen the movie Hugo, that's based on his life. Fascinating individual, a magician, basically using the magic of the uh, video camera into a way of essentially breaking ground when it comes to what cinema is capable of. German Expressionism was not a single person. It was an artistic movement to get the Impressionism or the High Renaissance. Specifically, we had deliberate distortion as a way of conveying some of the internal situation of a character. If a character was in a very troubled situation, we would actually see the landscapes around them being twisted and distorted. I mean, you see the show things. 
all those weird hallways, the deepest house, all of that oddity, that's all German Expressionism. And it's probably the one art movement that is most evident in Tim Burton's uh, early films. And furthermore, when it comes to the legacy of these films, Nosferatu may not be the most important when it comes to how subsequent films have been appreciated. For example, it was not the first monster movie. There was already a film within German Expressionism, actually three films, two of them lost, called Gold, which had already come out before him, called him this uh, one figure where he's clay and humanoid that was reanimated in Prague. And uh, that could be considered a movie monster, but not only preceded it, but also it, but even preceded it within German Expressionism. It's also worth mentioning that the probably the biggest heavyweight of German Expressionism had already come out, which was the cabinet of Public Art. And if you were to compare Nosferatu to, to probably the most high production film of German Expressionism, which was Fritz Lang's Metropolis, Nosferatu is almost going to seem like a very mild, almost like a low budget film in comparison. But where Nosferatu surpasses all of that is with the creation of this monster that we're going to be seeing. Something that we're going to be seeing uh, the rest of the world eventually catch up to when it comes to, say, Block Cheney with his contract with Notre Dame, or when it comes to his fantasy of the opera. The character of Nils Prato is one of the great gifts that the back from cinema, who has survived almost an entire century since then as one of the greatest incarnations of a vampire ever in film. In my opinion, one of the most underappreciated special effects when it comes to makeup, and also one of the great underappreciated performances when it comes to uh, sound film actor Max Shrek, who actually didn't wear a lot of makeup when it came to the performance, which of course says something about him. But moving forward, there's something else I want to mention, and that's the controversy of this Now, while those of you who would have been seeing it in theaters at the time wouldn't have likely known about it, this film was an unauthorized adaptation of uh, a Bram Stoker's record. We don't know why it was unauthorized. There's many good reasons that it could have been unauthorized, simply because there were not very clear laws at the time when it came to international adaptation. It's also possible that the Germans simply want to Germanize it, essentially giving this foreign story, especially after World War II, where they had just fought a war against Great Britain, and wanted to adapt it to a more dramatic story. And there's even discussions about um, anything ranging from, again, trying to adapt it to accusations of anti-Semitism, which I don't entirely subscribe to. There are numerous Jewish filmmakers that were involved in this film. Uh, the director himself was gay, and based on how he followed through their uh, past politics, not many, not many of them, let me put it this way, German film is not a very popular place in this time of history when you can recruit it future Nazi filmmakers, which many of them come later. But ultimately, when it comes to the controversy surrounding this film, it was Bram Stoker's widow, Florence Stoker, who actually tried to to the production of this film, and she faced a big problem. The company that produced the film went out of business, so she wasn't able to get much money from a bank company. So nevertheless, she sued and was awarded the right to have the film destroyed. So they made every effort to find every copy of this, and in one analysis of the film I actually saw before today's discussion, they actually equated Florence uh, Stoker for the rest of her life being almost like a Van Helsing, going out of her way to find copies of this film and destroy it. And she failed. There was one international copy of it. As mentioned, it was premiered in 1922. It was shared overseas, eventually in the United States in 1929. And as mentioned, the versions that we have now are all copied from a print that was fortunately preserved in France in 1924. And although it did premiere in the United States in 1929, I believe it wasn't until 1947 that a copy of it was donated to a, uh, a New York film museum on that specific. So all of this surrounds the film, and it's actually for that reason that this is considered one of the first examples of a cult classic. I actually think it's a better example of a cult classic than the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, because unlike the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, this film did not survive. I'm sorry, this film, unlike Dr. Caligari, required word of mouth and reputation, and it's literally a cult of very small group of people to keep it alive. It's usually that appreciation for it, but that small group of individuals have that turns the big Lebowski into Lebowski, or turns uh, you know, Rocky Horror Picture Show into 
So all of this surrounding the film and its ultimate uh, rediscovery and reappreciation re has given a reputation that it now has. And before we go into it, I just want to very quickly show some of the samples of the artwork that you might have actually seen if you were learning about this film or in a film lobby or if you knew one of the filmmakers in the Century Festival post report. What we see over here, this is a concept art from production designer Alvin Rao. And as I said before, if you saw this film on its own with no understanding or no familiarity with silent films, you might think that's a cheap special effect. They could have done better there, that's an error over there. But as you can see over here, this is the only still from the film that I'm going to show you. The concept art, the exaggerations that they have over here, the gross distortions, the use of shadow, the fantastic use of shadow in this film. The painstaking detail that the filmmakers went to recreate it, the concept art to the final product is truly a sight of people. It's, when you're watching this, it's almost a moving painting. So much detail went into the location of mirrors, reflections, every single prop that was in the scene. The detail in this film is truly cool. And lastly, here's some of the promotional posters. Again, from the brow that uh, would have been used for the film. Again, so much of the surrounding, this incredible creation of Masquerade. Whose etymology we actually are not entirely sure about. Graham Stoker is credited to a Romanian word for bloodsucker. But we know that the word had already existed before Graham Stoker. And even among Romanians, there's no absolute definition of what it is. I've actually heard one speculation going as far as Greek, that Nosferatu might be a corruption of the Greek word for plague carriers, which works very well in this film's use of symbolism and its own personal take on Dracula and vampires in general. So just a few things to keep in mind as we watch this film. Again, for silent movie going, this is a film that would have had a live orchestra playing a carefully designed score to accompany it. So please keep that in mind, and again, there would be screaming. If you want, that fun with the film. Treat it like a Rocky Horror Picture, laugh at it, point out, and inside it. It adds to the environment. Something else when it comes to daylight and nighttime, this film is very famous for introducing to vampire lore the idea that sunlight can kill a vampire. But there's still debate over whether it's the rising sun, whether it's sunlight in general, and furthermore, you're going to be seeing scenes where a vampire is very clearly walking out in broad daylight. So keep in mind that there would have been tinting in this film. If there was a teal color accompanying the film, the audience would have known and understood that that was supposed to symbolize nightmare. And lastly, time. This is a film that was premiering not only a few years after World War I and after Germany was in this transformational period and also this period of doubt and disbelief over their defeat in the war, but it was also taking place after the pandemic of influenza. I'm not exactly going to say this. The recent pandemic that we are living through right now has prepared us as an audience for this film more than any audience in the century. So keep all of this in mind. Try to look at these parallels for a couple of years. We watch most of the